You are watching Christ's Commission Fellowship. Changing lives for eternity. Do you know that February is love month? And I praise God that the Bible has a lot to say about love. You know, love is something that everybody likes to discuss. You see those nice movies, there's a love component. Now, there are different kinds of love, okay? For example, the first kind of love, when you guys were young, what is that kind of love? Rush. Then, as you grow older, what is this? Infatuation. How many of you had cross or infatuation in the past? Raise your hand. <laughs> you know, I remember the cross on my teacher, <laughs> crazy, and uh, it's funny, but uh, that's how love is. But is that really love? What about this one? Romantic love. How many, how many of you have this experience, romantic love? Raise your hand. Nahiya na kayo, no? It's getting sensitive, huh? Romantic love. I have good news for you. I'm still in romantic love. I praise God. And then, you have a committed kind of love. Today, I want to talk about the committed kind of love. It's a commitment. Say that to your neighbor. True love is a commitment. It transcends feelings. Okay, the one thing of Jesus, everybody, let's review. This month, our focus is on the one thing of Jesus. He wants us to love God and love others. Everybody, let's practice. Love God, love others. So if I see you again next week, I ask you what's the message? What's the one thing of Jesus? Love God, love others. Easier said than done. So our foundational verse is Matthew 22, 36 to 38. When a lawyer asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is, everybody, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. In other words, the greatest commandment, the most important commandment of the entire teachings of God is love him with all your heart. And if you love him with all your heart, he tells you, what must you do next? He said, the second is like it, everybody. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is this. Who is your neighbor? How do you love yourself? Some of us have a hard time loving ourselves. We don't know how to love neighbors. Well, today, hopefully, I want to teach you something about how to love your neighbor as yourself. And then... To show you how important these teachings, how important is this particular teaching, he tells us, everybody read, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you learn to love God with all your heart, and if you love your neighbor, you have obeyed the entire Bible. So let's keep it simple, everybody. Love God, love one another. If you love God, you'll obey him. If you love your neighbor, you won't take advantage of them. And if your children love God, you don't have to worry about drugs. You don't have to worry about premarital sex. Because they love God, they obey Him. They will study hard. Why? They love God. If they don't love God, everything is a problem. If you don't love God, everything is a problem. Coming on time here is a problem. Worshiping God is a problem. Reading the Bible is a problem. Why? You don't love God. What you have is religion. Religion is all about duty. And duty will tire you out. It's all about obligation. And God is saying, uh, I don't like that kind of relationship. I want love. I love you. Will you love me back? If you love him, listen to me. If you love God, I guarantee you, your life will change. So go back to basic. Today, the application is of loving God, everybody read, love difficult people. One more time. Love difficult people. People. How many of you have difficult people around you? No, I don't, no, no, no. I'm not saying seated now, okay? But you understand what I'm talking about. They are difficult people. Well, praise God. We are going to make the Bible so practical, so realistic. How do you love difficult people? Now, you, you got to understand the simplicity of the teachings of God. Religion complicates it. 
I want to keep it simple. For example, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Everybody read this together. You are called to freedom, brethren. Meaning, when Jesus comes into your life, you are set free from the bondages of legalism, from the bondages of sin. Some of us have been addicted to certain things for many years. And God promises he will set you free. If you are in bondage, addiction, we have pastors here to help you. We want to help you. We have many people who have been set free from addiction to pornography, computer games, drugs, gambling, you name it, womanizing. We are all, once upon a time, addicted. Yes or no? The only difference is what kind of addiction, but God says, I'm going to set you free. Now, he gives you a warning. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, don't say, because I'm saved, because I'm going to go to heaven already, I can do whatever I want to do. You see, many people are not discipled properly. So they use this excuse. I am already forgiven. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm free. Ah, uh-uh. the Bible says, excuse me. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity, an excuse for the flesh to commit sin. Everybody read, but through love, serve. See, love is other-centered. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In this statement, everybody read, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Can I tell you my prayer? I don't know about you. How do you pray for people? The Lord taught me recently how to pray for people, how to pray for church members, how to pray for these ones. Can I teach you how to pray? Most of us, I can almost predict when you pray, you pray, Lord, uh, protect me from sickness or Lord, heal this person. Am I correct? I mean, that's our usual prayer. I will now teach you an example of biblical prayer. For example, the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers in Philippi. This is his prayer. Everybody read. And this I pray. Everybody? Together. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Notice, God wants us to grow in love. So if I were to ask you today, how many of you are loving right now? You're loving. Raise your hands. You're loving. How many of you need to grow in love? Raise your hands. And how many of you will never raise your hands no matter what I do? (laughs) All right. The truth is, I need to grow in love. So you pray. You pray for me, I pray for you. Is that okay? Let's pray for each other. Notice that your love may abound. It will grow. It will multiply. More and more. You notice how redundant the Bible is? You already have the word abound, and now you have the word more, and then you have more. But then there's qualification. In real knowledge and all discernment. Because many people love, but they do not know what true love is. They love, but they don't know how to love. So the Bible says you need to learn, to discern, to grow in real knowledge. Believe it or not, it begins with knowledge of God, how He loves you so you can love others. So how many of you would like to learn to love more? Raise your hands. You want to learn more. Higher, higher. Because I'm about to send some of you back home already. If you... Okay. Like this group. You want to learn more? Okay, raise your hand. All right. You know, God gave me amazing eyes. I can see even to the last row here. You all want to love more? Raise your hands. See, I'm watching you. Praise God. That's called humility. You know, some proud people will never raise their hands. Let me repeat. If you have a problem cooperating, raising your hands, or you, you refuse to raise your hands, you ask yourself, why not? And I'll give you the answer. Most of the time, it's your pride. You don't want to be told what to do. I understand that. You know why? I'm proud also. Once upon a time, I don't like to be told what to do. But I have learned to maximize worship. You humble yourselves. Everybody, let's humble ourselves. Amen? Let's grow. Let's learn to love more. Amen? Amen. All right. So, I want to pray for all of you. Lord Jesus, it's my prayer that CCF and everybody that's listening to us all over the world will grow in this particular subject, how to love, 
how to grow. And Lord, apart from you, we cannot really learn to love properly. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, why is it so hard? If the command is so clear, why is it so hard to love? Can I tell you why? Because many times you are not discipled properly. You are not taught properly. I assume responsibility. I have changed our discipleship emphasis. Because many times our emphasis is on knowledge. We think to disciple people, you let them have knowledge. Well, the Bible says, you know, knowledge does not equal spiritual maturity. You know what knowledge will do? Knowledge makes arrogant. So a lot of people have lots of Bible knowledge. But I noticed something about them. They're not loving, but they know a lot. So I'm warning you. Knowledge is not equal to maturity. You can know a lot of Bible truths, memorize verses, know all kinds of doctrines, but spiritually you're a babe. So be careful. I'm not against knowledge. I study a lot. I've been studying all my life. Knowledge is important, but it does not equal maturity. What about zeal? Some people are zealous. They like to serve. Well, you can be zealous, but not mature. That's possible. That's possible. So we don't emphasize the right thing. We emphasize people to get involved in ministry. So they are so busy, but there's no love. What about the myth of sacrifice? Wow. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I deliver my body to be burned, what a sacrifice, but do not have love. The Bible says it's nothing. In other words, God looks at the heart. So right now he's looking at your heart, and he knows whether you love him or you don't love him. If you love him, you will obey him. If you don't love him, he knows. I can pretend. I can go to church. I can act properly and deceive all of you. And I was shocked. I know of somebody who I became a Nino. He's not from this church. But I was so impressed with this guy. He's a leader of his church. So I agreed, okay, I'll be your Nino. I was shocked to discover this man was such a fake. He was stealing the money of his church for the last 12 years. He was a leader of his church. He makes a lot of nice story. And I realized you and I can pretend. But no real relationship with Jesus. I got a shock of my life. You know, there's another myth. Which is a real problem, the myth of feeling. You know, for many of us, we think love is a feeling. I'm going to expand this later on. I'm going to warn you right now. True love is more than a feeling. Remember that song I used to sing? When I fall in love, it will be forever. Notice the song. When I fall in love. How in the world do you fall in love? That's why you fall out of love. I don't fall in love. I grow in love. Honey baby, I loved you 46 years ago, and I love you even more. Yeah, because love grows. So the topic today is very simple. Love difficult people. Everybody, how do you love difficult people? How? Well, <laughs> there are different kinds of difficult people, okay? Some people are difficult to love because they are always angry. Do you know somebody like that in your family? Lacking galette. It's mad all the time. It's amazing. Mad all the time. Do you know some people like that? Yeah. Oh, yes. It's not too loud. Yes, I know. What about some people are talkative? You know, they just love to talk. You know, when people, I know some people in our group, well, not our group, but I know some people, I have to be careful. When, when people are talking, listen to me. When they're talking, this person, not in our group, but this person, <laughs> We suddenly change the topic, and it's all about herself. If you talk about, you know, this guy said, you know, I went fishing, I caught this fish, and then somehow the conversation will change. You know, I also did this, ta, 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 ta. my fish is so big. Ta, ta, ta. 
Excuse me. You know, some people are talkative. Yes or no? Yeah. Not so easy to love, huh? What about this one? Madam Negative, Mr. Negative. Always negative. Always complaining, always grumbling. Man, you, you, you try to avoid these people. Yes or no? Do you know of such people like that? Or are you the one? Always negative. Always like attending a funeral service. You, you are not smiling. What about this one? Yeah, it's not proud people. Do you know such people who are proud? Is it easy to love proud people? Louder. Are you proud? See, difficult people. So how do you love them? Well, let me tell you something. Why is this method so important? Some of you have been hurt. And I realize for us believers, love is not an option. Let me repeat. Love for us is not an option. To love is to be vulnerable. To love is to be willing to get hurt. If you don't want to be hurt, you withdraw. Don't love. And some of you have stopped loving people because you have protected yourself. And that's how people become hardened. That's how you become cynical. Because you refuse to love. I like what C.S. Lewis said. To love is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Not even to an animal. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and the possibility is you will get hurt. But if you lock it up in the casket of your selfishness, in the casket, in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, you know, you, know, you hide your heart. You don't want to love anybody. Sure, it will not be broken, but it will, it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to that tragedy, if you don't want to be hurt, if you don't want to love, is damnation. What does he mean by damnation? This is what he said. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Because in hell, there's no love. So I think this message is so important. So how do we love difficult people? I have five principles I want to share with you. Simple five principles. And it's a definition, okay? So number one, everybody, true love is from God. How did God love us? Well, you will see this from the Bible. Everybody, number one, God's love for us. Everybody read, unconditional commitment. Say that with me. Unconditional commitment. Towards imperfect people. For what purpose? To seek their highest good. Oftentimes requires sacrifice for his glory. So if you ask me, what is true love? Well, I know that true love comes from God. So in one sentence, what is true love? Everybody, it is an unconditional commitment. Repeat, unconditional commitment. Meaning, it transcends feelings. Unconditional commitment. Together, unconditional commitment towards imperfect people. Do you know to love perfect people is not a problem? To love nice people is not a problem. To love imperfect people, that's a challenge. Unconditional commitment towards imperfect people to seek their highest good. Love is thinking of the others, what's good for them which may require sacrifice. And you do it because of Christ, for God's glory. All right. That's the whole message today. I want to expand that. How do I love difficult people? Well, number one, I got to realize I am not able to love people. I'm not able. It has come from God. So the Bible is very clear. The Bible says love is from God together. Beloved, let us love one another. 
Why? Love is from God. Now, the amazing word in the English language for the word love is only one word, love. In the Greek, you have four words, four different words, at least four. The first one is storge. Storge talks about the love of a father to a child. It's parental love, storge. The next one is phileo, filial, friendship. You're my friend. Let's love each other. The next one is eros, erotic, eros love. It has to do with romantic. It has to do with the opposite sex. And many times, there's a lot of sex involved here, okay? Nothing wrong. All of these are invented by God. And then the last one is agape. The word agape was popularized by Jesus and his disciples because the focus is not on the object of love. The focus is on the giver. Agape is an unconditional commitment of the lover toward the loved ones. So that is what the Bible uses. The word love in the original language, every time you see it connected with God, almost 99%. Beloved, let us agape one another. For agape, notice, he's not using the word eros. He's not using the word storge. This kind of love, true love, is from God. Next, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. God is love. I have stopped focusing, telling people, Are you a Christian? Are you not? If they say, you know, I raised my hand when I was 13 years old. I went forward when I was 16 years old. Therefore, I'm a Christian. Those kind of answers, I now tell people, be careful. Because coming forward, raising your hand, does not automatically make you a Christian. A Christian, yes, something happened. Once upon a time in your life, you gave your life to Jesus. But there has to be evidence. The Bible says the evidence of a true Christian is love. If you don't love, you don't know God. God is love. Love is not God. But knowing God will make you love. The Bible tells us we love because he first loved us. So if you are having a problem loving people, I have good news for you. The good news is this. Starting today, after this morning service, you can learn to be loving. I'm going to teach you how. First, experience the love of God. You cannot give what you don't have. How can you love difficult people when you yourself do not have that kind of love? So it begins with God. Are we agree? Is that clear? So love comes from God. You need to encounter God. Next, it's an unconditional commitment. Where do you learn that? Well, let's look at the Bible. What do you mean unconditional commitment? A new commandment I give to you, you love one another. Notice, you love, you agape one another, even as I have agape you, that you agape one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Notice. How can you legislate? How can you command love? Unless it transcends feelings. You see, love is an unconditional commitment. That's why it is a command. It transcends feelings. How many of you are mothers here? Mothers. Mothers. Will you please stand up? I want to talk to mothers. Mothers, please stand up. Let me tell you about mothers. You know why I praise God for mothers? I admire mothers. Fathers, you have no idea what I'm going to talk about now. You know why? Because you are not a mother. Mothers, when the baby came out, was it painful? Louder? Yes. Yes. When the baby was growing, six months, eight months, ten months, was it difficult for you? Yes. You know why? When the baby cries, and you are tired, what do you do at night? You get up. Husband, what do you do? You sleep. (laughs) Why? Mothers, I really praise God for mothers. I I have children. I, I began to appreciate mothers even more. 
they really sacrifice. So you know a little of God's love. You know it is more than feeling. When you don't feel like loving that baby, you go there and you carry that baby. And that baby has no way of loving you back. Because all that baby does is to poop and cry. Poop and cry. Poop and cry. And what do you do? Diaper, diaper, change. That's love. Unconditional commitment. Thank you. Sit down. Praise God for mothers. Now, the Bible is very clear how God loves us. Look at what the Bible says. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. You were the fewest of all peoples. In other words, the Bible is telling us when God chose the nation of Israel, by the way, the power, the attractiveness of any nation in those days are the numbers of people. The bigger the number, the more powerful the nation. And God is saying, I chose Israel not because you are a great nation. In fact, you are a nobody. You guys were so little. So why did God choose Israel? This is the answer. Everybody read. But because the Lord loved you. In other words, God is saying, Peter, I love you. Period. You see, gentlemen, every time you tell your girlfriend, I love you because... You have a big cause. You are beautiful. That's a lot of pressure. Why? What happens if your girlfriend will have an accident and her face is scarred? She feels insecure because you are loving her with a reason. I love you, baby. You are so beautiful. That's a conditional love. You see, when I married my wife 40 plus years ago, I told my wife, honey, I love you, period. My wife knows there's nothing she can do that will make me not love her. I told my wife, no matter what, I love you and I will love you. That kind of love is unconditional commitment because that's how God loved me. God says, I love you, period. So what is true love? It's from God, amen? Amen. You cannot do this on your own. Next, it is an unconditional commitment. That's how God loves us. You know, some are loved because they are valuable. You love certain things because they are valuable, right? Yes? But some are valuable because they are loved. Let me repeat. Some are valuable and that's why they are loved. Some are valuable simply because they are loved. I belong to the next, to the latter one. I am valuable. You know why? I am loved by the Lord. The Lord did not love me because I am precious. I am precious because he loved me. Tell your neighbor, you are precious because God loves you. See, that's how we are to love people. Okay. Unconditional commitment towards imperfect people. Now, to love perfect people is no problem. You know, my wife is almost perfect. So for me to love my wife is no problem. But for my wife to love me, that is another story. <laughs> you know, the Bible tells us how God loves us. You, you and I are to love imperfect people. You know why? How did God love us? Everybody read this. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice. What can you learn about love? It's from God. God demonstrates his love. So God's love is action. What did he do for us? While we were yet sinners, Christ, God did not wait 
until we repented, until we became good before he died for us. God tells us, as is, where is. True love is loving somebody as is. Let me repeat. True love is loving somebody as is. However, because you love somebody as is, where is, and it is true love, you are going to pray and you are going to desire that they don't remain as is, where is. You see, God loves me as is, where is. But he loves me so much that he will not allow me to remain as I am. He will use problems. He will use circumstances. He will use people to change me. God loves you as is, where is. But because he loves you, he will not stop trying to transform you to be the kind of person God wants you to be. For your own good. That's true love. You see, it's from God. It is unconditional, unconditional commitment towards imperfect people. While we were still sinners. Different types of people, you know. You know, some people are really like my wife. They're lovable. A little like me sometimes. Lovable. Some people are just nice, okay? They, they, they are nice. You don't mind being with them. There are some people that are, I call them neutral. Not, you don't really look forward to them, but at the same time, you don't try to avoid them. They, they are, meh, you know, neutral, neutral, okay? They are not antagonistic. They, they are just neutral. Now, there are some people in this room or in your house that are a bit irritating at times, Okay? Uh, they are just different. Would you like to know what are some people that I really don't like? Would you like to know? Or should I not tell you? Well, years ago, I will tell you years ago. <laughs> I discovered certain types of people will really irritate me. I remember a missionary sent us a young boy to take care for, I think, one week. And that young boy, I noticed something. I usually like young boys. I mean, they're like my son. But this one, I, I'm really irritated. Let me tell you why. Because that boy is so picky, so picky when it comes to food. He will only eat chicken wing. <laughs> and I told my wife, uh-uh. When I was growing up, my father taught me something. Whatever food you eat. And then the famous line of the older Chinese. China is very poor. People are dying of hunger. So learn to eat anything. So that's what we grew up with. We learned to eat anything. Except bats and uh, rats. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but this young boy would only eat chicken wing. So I told my wife. Don't give him chicken wing. You know what he did? He didn't eat. I told my wife, don't worry. He won't die. <laughs> Dinner time came. No chicken wing. But by that time, he was hungry. After one week in our house, that boy was transformed supernaturally. <laughs> that boy can eat anything. You know why? That's how life is, right? Now, some people... Now, some people are very neat. They are very neat. You know, if you look at their room, you will see all the socks piled up. You will see all the briefs. You will see all the panties. I mean, everything is so clean. I am not like that. You know why? <clears throat> so I praise God. You know, my wife would like to fix things up. Now, in my desk, I have a private desk. It's not clean, okay? It's lots of paper. And my wife used to try to Clean up my table. I said, honey, if you love me, don't touch my table. <laughs> and that will irritate me. You know why? Because she will do something and I cannot find my stuff. I get irritated. So I said, honey, we are different. And I like what Einstein said. Have you heard of Einstein? Einstein was told, if your table is cluttered and messy, it's because you are cluttered and messy. 
Einstein said, well, how do you describe a table that's empty? The mind is empty. <laughs> so, honey, my mind is not empty. It's cluttered. <laughs> Lots of stuff. Anyway, some people, they're annoying. They're just annoying. Do you have some people like that? I try to avoid them. Do you have people like that? You know, every time they come, they pour out their life story. They sap you of energy. They're just annoying. Now, all of us, believe it or not, all of us are annoying. All of us are also imperfect. Yes or no? But you are irritated different ways. But you cannot see how people are irritated with your own behavior. Yes or no? So, I remember in the zoo. I love to visit zoo. I was in New York, Central Park. It's a nice zoo there. One of the biggest zoo is in New York City. And I was so curious. I wanted to see the most dangerous animal in the world. The most dangerous animal in the world. I told my wife, we got to see this. So we, we kept looking for it. There's a sign. Most dangerous animal, arrow. So you have to put your head inside the cage, right, to see. So I put my head inside to see. There's a mirror. And I saw the mirror. <laughs> I am the most dangerous animal in the world. My friend, to love difficult people, you have to admit. I have to admit. I am the one that's difficult. You know, sometimes we judge people. But we don't fail to see our own imperfection. Well, the Bible does not stop there. We have to love all kinds of people. Especially enemy. Wow, enemy. Do you see why this message is crucial? He's not just talking about annoying people. He's talking about love your enemy. What's, what do I mean? Well, let's read this together. Everybody read this. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? According to Jesus. Even sinners love those who love them. Everybody read. But love your enemies. Do good to your enemies. My friend, this week, there was a national prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. I attended that with my wife a few years ago. That's where the president, senators, congressmen, they gathered together in Washington, D.C. One of their guest speakers is by the name of uh, Brooks. This is what he talked about before Donald Trump gave his amazing speech. Arthur Brooks said, everybody read this together. Civility and tolerance are low standards. Jesus did not, did not say tolerate your enemies. He said love your enemies. Answer hatred with love. You see, my friend, the problem with us today, we don't take the teachings of Jesus seriously. We don't understand what he's saying. He's not saying you tolerate people you don't like. He does not say you accept people that's different from you. He says love your enemies. What's the message today? Love difficult people. Can you turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, love difficult people. It is not an option. It is a command. And you cannot love difficult people until you experience God's love. If you have a problem loving difficult people, you've you got to begin with God. Lord, I don't know this love. You cannot give what you don't have. Imperfect people to seek their highest good. Notice what the Bible says. I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Notice, this is our memory verse last year. I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So friends, if you want to start a viral movement, not the coronavirus, but I want us to begin something, all CC efforts, let's do something supernatural through the power of God. Let's begin to love difficult people. Let's begin loving people the way God wants us to love. What do you think? Shall we do it? Begin today. And the Bible says, how do you do it? Very simple. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. 
You see, our problem is we are governed by feelings. That's the problem. For many of us, we don't understand. When God commands us something, it transcends feelings. But many of us are saying, I don't feel it. And because I don't feel it, I will not do it. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Have you heard of that? I'm a fake. I'm a hypocrite. Excuse me. My wife gave me the best definition of hypocrisy. Do you know what is true hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is knowing something right. It is knowing something that God wants you to do, and you don't do it. That is hypocrisy. You see, for us, we equate hypocrisy with feeling. I don't feel it. So if I do it, I'm a hypocrite. Ah, you are being true. You are being obedient. If Jesus were to follow his feelings, he would not have died on the cross. Because before he died on the cross, he did not feel like suffering on the cross. He prayed, Lord, if possible, let this cup pass away from me. Hypocrisy is knowing something you need to do and you don't do it. You have misunderstood hypocrisy. If you wait for feeling to come, it will never come. So here's the principle I want to share with all of us. In this room, you have two kinds of people. One, governed and controlled and slaved to feelings. I call them immature Christians. You have another group. They've grown. They've become mature. You're able to control your feeling. You are able to allow your feeling to submit to your will. Love should never be the servant of feelings. Love is the servant of the will. There are two kinds of people. And some of you are still immature. Enslaved to your feeling. I, I don't feel it. I cannot do it. Go beyond it. Learn the principle of motion before emotion. You do it, emotion will follow. Remember I shared this story years ago? Years ago. Somebody did something unjust to me and to our family. I never felt more betrayed because they, this person was our good friend, family friend. Ninong of my brother's wedding. But he betrayed us. When he was sick, somebody called me. Peter, he wants you to visit him. He wants you to pray for him. In my mind, I'm not going to do that. Why? I don't feel like doing it. How will I, why will I visit you? Why will I pray for you? You have betrayed our family. You have betrayed me. In fact, this is the same guy who fired me from my company. I said, I'm not going to go. I'm not going. Then the Lord spoke to me. The Lord said, Peter, I command you to pray for people. I've commanded you to love your enemies. If you don't obey me, how are you going to teach the Bible someday? You're a fake. You're a hypocrite. You know what's right and you don't do it. So when they called again, I said, okay, I'm going. But let me tell you from my heart. I don't feel like going. I don't feel like praying. In my mind, why would I pray for him? What if he gets well? <laughs> In my mind, that guy deserved to get sick. He deserved to be punished. Why should I pray for him? Do you understand my feeling? I'm being honest. And they share the gospel. Why should I share the gospel? What if he accepts Christ and goes to heaven? You know, this last-minute conversion is very effective. <laughs> I'm being honest. But you know what? I obeyed. Motion before emotion. So when I went to his house, I knocked. The wife opened the door, welcomed me, brought me to the bedroom. And when he opened the bedroom, when, when I saw him, my goodness, I stretched out my hand. And my love for him came. I do not explain it. I felt sorry for him. I really had a, you know, compassion. 
I realize that is supernatural. Only God can do that. So this love is from where? From God. To love imperfect people, don't depend on feeling. You got to do it. You know, I'm reminded of um, a few weeks ago, we were in a party. Now remember, to love difficult people is one thing, but God says love your enemies. How many of you have enemies? I'm surprised. You know, how come you have enemies? You have enemies? Okay. If I ask you, do you have difficult people around you? Raise your hand. Okay. That is normal to me. We all have difficult people. But enemies. Do you have enemies? Raise your hand. Oh, see? Well, many of us have enemies also. Well, I'm surprised. I don't hate anybody. But I discovered there are people who hated me. They make it known. They will never meet me. They will not talk to me. But the Lord taught me, do to others as you want them to do unto you. My temptation is to avoid them. So you know what I did? In obedience to the Lord. I said, I will be a godly person. I'll be a nice person. Now, how would you feel if somebody snub you? Be honest. But you know what? By the grace of God. To this day, I still love them. And the Lord taught me. If you love them, you pray for them. So I began to pray for people. I'm praying for people who don't like me. And I realized my job is not to make them love me. My job is to love them. Whether they will love me or they will not, whether they will talk to me or not, that's between them and the Lord. On judgment day, that is God's department. That's not mine. What's my job? Love people. And the Bible says, only God can help you. The Bible says, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one that gives you love. Notice the grammar. The love of God, not the love for God. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible tells us the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. So this is from God. My friend, if I can give you one incentive why you should come to know Jesus and surrender your life, it's your capacity to love people. It will happen supernaturally. Every true follower of Jesus will encounter this. I, I was given the permission by this sister to share her story. You see, this sister, I cannot mention her name yet, she told me, don't mention her name, but give her story. She was married for nine years with two kids. This girl, married for nine years, her husband was a womanizer, alcoholic. The husband left her with two kids. When the son was around, I believe, perhaps 10 years old, the son developed a brain disease. A disease that the doctor said incurable. So here's the mother with a son and a daughter. The son, 10 years old, the doctor said only six months to live or maximum two years. So the wife loved the son, took care of the son, but the husband refuses to help, not even give a single centavo. That young boy continued living for two extra years, four years, two years bedridden. The husband refuses to help. You know, when I heard the story, I really felt bad. How can a father do that? And then the father will not even visit the son. The father will only visit the son twice a year. Birthday and Christmas. The last day, when the son was still alive, the wife called the father, please come, visit him. The doctor said he's, he's going to die. Visit him while he's still alive. She called her husband eight times in one day, every hour, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, please come, please come. He's dying, he's dying, please come. The husband or the father refuses to come. The, the son died 
And after the son died, one and a half hour later, the father showed up. This girl told me, I was so bitter, I was so angry. I don't blame her. In desperation, sometimes God uses problems to bring us to him. Her mother invited her to come to CCF. So she attended CCF. It so happens I was the one preaching. It so happens my topic was forgiveness. And she said, Peter, you may not know this. When you ask people to stand up, I could not even stand. I was crying. I was seated crying because God spoke to me. Can I tell you what she did? Some of you got to do this. After the service, that same afternoon, she texted the mistress and the husband. I forgive you. I love you. That's it. She was set free. And then the testing came. Her husband became blind with one eye. So I said, what did you do? She visited the husband, helped the husband, bring the husband to the hospital, spent money in the hospital to help her ex-husband. I said, what? After what he did to you? I remember I told you, love is from God. It's a commitment towards imperfect people to seek their highest good, which oftentimes requires what? Sacrifice. You know, she sacrificed her time, her effort, and praise God, the husband could not see. Now, you keep praying for this couple, okay? The story is not yet finished. So, perhaps something will happen in their marriage. In the meantime, not all story will end with happy ending because we're still alive. So let's see what's going to happen. Amen? Now, i like all of you to learn to love God. You know why? Look at what the Bible says. Why will this result in God's glory? Everybody read this. By this, all men will know. You are my disciples if you have loved for one another. Notice what the Bible says. Because of this, because of loving one another, all men will know you are my disciples. In other words, the best way to testify for Jesus is not always through your words. You are judged not by your creed, by your deed. People judge us not by what we say, but by what we do. Jesus said, if you love one another, the whole world will know you are my fathers. My friend, how can a group of men in the time of Jesus, during the Roman Empire, no money, no power, how can a group of men change the entire Roman Empire? Explain that to me. How can a group of men and women, the only thing they had, they followed Jesus. How did they transform the entire Roman Empire. Can I tell you how? By loving one another. The power of love. Aristides was an apologist. He defended the Christian faith. But he did not use the Bible. He did not use the resurrection. He talks about the life of believers. He was trying to convince Emperor Hadrian who did not like Christians? He was convincing the emperor why he should become a Christian. Can I tell you what he wrote about Christians? How he defended Christians? This is what he said. He said, Christians have the commands of the Lord Jesus in their heart. They do not engage in adultery or sexual immorality they do not bear false witness, neither do they covet that which belongs to others. They honor father and mother. They love their neighbors. They do not do to others anything that they do not wish to be done to them. They comfort those who endure them, even trying to win them over as their friends. They are eager to do good to their enemies. 
They abstain from unlawful lifestyles and all impurity. They neither neglect the widow nor oppress the orphan. And he continued. They're even willing to die for their Messiah, Jesus. This is how he defended Christianity. And history tells us Hadrian became one of the best emperors in Rome. Why? I like to believe because he had a friend called Aristides. My friend, when people look at CCF, when people look at us, you know what's my prayer? That we will be known for our love, not for our knowledge. How will you practice this? May I suggest, today, when you go home, you practice love at home. Okay? When you go home, you ask your parents, Mommy, Daddy, what can I do to serve you? Okay? When you get out of here, be nice to your neighbor. Don't push them, okay? When you ride the elevator, don't push them. What do you do? Let them go first. When you go to the car park, don't make seeing it. Let them do it first. Oh, no, really. Let's practice loving each other. In the office, at work, don't gossip. When people say bad things, don't gossip. Love people. My friend, I just pray that CCF will begin a revolution. You know what revolution? I want us to be viral. Not with coronavirus, but the virus of love. The love of Jesus. Is it okay with you? Praise God. All right. So, starting today, for this month, what are we going to practice? Love. Love God, love each other. But the truth is this. You cannot love each other until you first experience the love of God. Have you experienced the love of God? Let's pray. With your heads bowed down, if you like to experience God's love, you are willing to humble yourselves and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to experience God's love. Will you raise your hands? You want to experience God's love. Raise your hand. In fact, stand up. Stand up. You want me to pray for you? You want to experience God's love? You say, Pastor, I really, I really don't know if I've experienced the love of God and for the unconditional forgiveness of God, but today I want to experience this love so I can love others. Do you understand what I'm asking you to do? I'm asking you to humble yourselves and to experience and receive God's unconditional love. And you pray this prayer. If God is speaking to you and you have bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, well, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need your love. I cannot love others in my own power. So today I ask you to allow me to experience your unconditional forgiveness, your unconditional commitment, your love to me, Lord. I receive this love. Thank you for loving me. As you have forgiven me, Lord, I choose to forgive others. I choose to love difficult people around me. I will make it my mission to share your love with people. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to my life. Help me grow to love others more and more. Help me to discern what true love is. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.